you are one of those who are honored by Allah. Do not belittle yourself. Do not think low of yourself. Why is someone else telling you how to feel about yourself? Change was never the result of the demand of the majority. The way you see yourself is going to determine how other people are going to see you. بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praise is due to Allah and may his peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم I bear witness that no one is worthy of worship but Allah and Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم was his final messenger Indeed the best of speech is a book of Allah and the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and the worst of matters is to innovate in religion, and every such kind of innovation is a misguidance, and misguidance leads to the hellfire. Begin by greeting my brothers and sisters, saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ يَا قَوْمِ ذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ And mentioned in the book, when Moses said to his people, O oh, my people, remember the bounties of Allah upon you. That He has appointed some of you as prophets, and He has appointed some of you as kings. And He has blessed you with that which no other people of your time were blessed with. يَا قَوْمِ ادْخُلُوا الْأَرْضَ الْمُقَدَّسَةَ الَّتِي كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ O oh, my people, Go into the holy land that Allah has promised you. All you have to do is just go there. Just walk to the holy land that Allah has promised you. Their response was, قَالُوا يَا مُوسَىٰ إِنَّ فِيهَا قَوْمًا جَبَّارِينَ They said, O oh Moses, in it are men who are exceedingly powerful. And so long that they are there, we will not go there. Moses reminded them of the bounties that Allah gave them. Later on, he reminded them of a commandment that was given to them by Allah. And they said, in it are men who are exceedingly powerful. They are surrendering. So they are exceedingly powerful and there is nothing that we can do about it. The same story was mentioned in the Bible. In a manner that does not contradict what the Quran says, However, there is an extra piece of information that is mentioned. They said, O oh Moses, in it are men who are exceedingly powerful. To them, we are like grasshoppers, and they see us as we see ourselves. They said, to them, we are like grasshoppers. That's what we think. To them, we are like grasshoppers, and they see us as we see ourselves. We've got a very important question to ask here. How do we see ourselves? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a grasshopper? Or do you see yourself as, it may be difficult, but I can do it. This is what they mean when they say self-image psychology. When you look into the mirror, what do you see? When you think about yourself, what comes to mind? Do you feel inferior, ashamed? Or there is that pride and dignity where you say that I have a contribution to make to mankind, positive contribution to make to mankind. So what happens now is we've got to learn about this concept. It's an interesting concept, self-image psychology. How do you see yourself? See, the way you see yourself is going to determine how other people are going to see you. And that is why many times, the easier way of manipulating you and controlling you is selling you an image for yourself. They tell you that you must think so of yourself so that they can, from there on, you are easier to manipulate and you are easier to control. For example, nowadays, give you a, an example from the States. And, and possibly you can relate to it because of television. Every time you watch TV, or TV that comes from the States, you will realize this. African Americans, 
These are the blacks in the states are called African Americans. When you see them, what do you see? They're gangsters, they're dancing, they're playing soccer, football, they're doing this. But the main projection of the African Americans in the state is that they are professional athletes. They've got Michael Jordan, they've got Kobe Bryant, they've got this player, they've got Serena Williams and her sister Venus Williams. And so what happens is that the image that is presented about them is that they're good athletes. It may be true, but listen to this. There are more African American medical doctors than there are African American professional athletes. Now by watching TV, there was no way that you can tell something like this was happening. Because the image now that is presented about them is that they're good for sports only. I remember one time I was giving a lecture and it happened that the people who were present because of the geography and the locality of the area, the people that were attending happened to be African Americans. And the minute I said this piece of information, one of them started weeping. He started crying. Why are you doing this? He said, I felt that I was deceived. I was cheated because what I was told of myself as an African American is that the best that I can do, the best that I could have done is the fact that I be a professional athlete. Not knowing that it was much easier to become a medical doctor than it is to become a professional athlete. It is much easier to become a medical doctor and not be singing and being shown on MTV. Yet you are deprived of this image because it makes you feel superior or it gives you some sort of hope. And what happens is that it must be crushed. I am not going to tell you that this thing is possible for you. I like to keep you where you are now. Do not belittle yourself. Do not think low of yourself. Do not have that inferiority in you. Where you see some people up here, but then when you think of yourself, you see yourself down here. And usually they say, that the people who have, and the Quran refers to, that, to such kind of people as people with izzah, people who've got dignity. You know, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, afsaduha. That when the kings arrive into a village or a locality, what do they do? They spread corruption. But in order to do so, there is another condition that has to go with it, and that is. But the people in that locality who've got izza, who've got dignity and pride, they must be debased because these are the people that are going to be problematic for us. And that is why when Allah speaks of Pharaoh, Fir'aun, Fir'aun was mentioned 73 times in the Quran, in 29 different chapters. What does he do? The first thing that he does is that he makes the people with izzah, with dignity and honor, he puts them down. Their souls must be crushed. Because the minute that you feel that I can say no, then you are dangerous. You are dangerous. And that is why your soul must be crushed. I quoted a man by the name of Frederick Douglass. Said that Frederick Douglass was a slave in the United States. And what happens is that when the slaves were brought, the first thing that the master would do is that he would check them out, as we say, or test them. Who amongst them is proud? Who amongst them looks problematic? Who amongst them seems to be rebellious? And then they have a treatment for them. Now, Frederick Douglass lived in the state of Maryland. And Maryland had a law. See, a slave was considered property. You kill them, you beat them, they were your property. Chattels, which means movable property. So Frederick Douglass comes in, and he sees this institution of slavery, and he thinks to himself, I am not a slave. I don't belong here. He is not my master. I am not supposed to be subjugated by him. I am not supposed to be serving him. I refuse this. And it, that was expected from some slaves, but they had a treatment for it. That treatment was a white man by the name of Ed Covey. If you were a rebellious slave, they send you to Eddie, who used his whip very liberally, if you know what I mean. 
He goes there, and for six months, daily, Frederick Douglass is beaten. Every day, he is beaten. They would get him, and he, they would just whip him. And the idea and the aim is to crush his soul, to crush his self-esteem and his self-pride, because that is very problematic. And then one day, in the words of Frederick Douglass, he said, I regained my self-respect. I did the unthinkable. What did he do? He fought back. The man is whipping him every time as a slave. You, you, when they whip you, you just surrender. You don't do anything. Because the state of Maryland had a law that said that any slave that attacked his honor, the master that is, his punishment was that he would be hanged, killed innocently. So now Frederick Douglass is here and he is being whipped for six months on daily basis. What does he do? He fights back and the story goes on to say that he wrestled Ed Covey and he beat him severely. Then he said, that day, I regained my self-pride. That day, I regained my self-respect. I got my Izza back and he said, it felt excellent. Even though the consequences could have been that I might die, but like they say, if you cannot live proudly, it is time to die proudly. But you cannot live in the state of humiliation. So he said, I regained my respect back. Similarly also, change was never done because the majority wanted. The majority is always a follower. I told the story of the sheikh that was invited to give a speech. And when he got to the place where he's supposed to be given the speech, not so many people showed up in the conference. So the organizers of the conference were not very happy with the turnout. Look, we've got this great place and very few people showed up. And we invited this man from such a long distance and very few people are showing up. They were disappointed. The sheikh looked at them and said, do not be disappointed with your numbers. We are not looking for numbers amongst our faithful. We are looking for faith amongst our numbers. Change be it secular, be it religious, was never the result of the demand of the majority. Rather, it was a committed minority with Izza that led my brothers and sisters. If you do not think high of yourself, then there is, there is really no contribution to make. You have nothing to offer. To begin with, you do not see yourself as a holder of rights. You do not see yourself as someone that has something to give. And that is why Islamically such a thing is not acceptable. Going back to the minorities, you know how African Americans in the state got their civil liberties back? One day, a woman by the name of Rosa Park, she was sitting in the bus. Sitting in the bus, if you were black, you belong to the back, at the back of the bus. That's where you sit. That is where you sit because you were, you know, at that point they were debating whether blacks were humans, three-fifths humans, some people said subhumans, some said equal humans but inferior, whatever it was. But the law, it was the state's law that if you were black, African Americans, you belong at the end of the bus. That's where you belong. So one day, an old woman, Rosa Park, she got on the bus and she said, you know what, why am I sitting at the end of the bus? I pay as much as these people pay. Why am I sitting at the end of the bus? And what does she do? She goes and she sits in the very front seat in the bus. The driver sees this. Excuse me, lady. Back. You get back. Why do I get back? Very obvious. You're black. You get back. That's where you belong. She said, I'm going nowhere. Or like they say in the States, I ain't going nowhere. What do you mean you're not going? You're black. That's where you belong. She had so much self-respect. She refused to get out of that bus. African Americans boycotted the bus system and they had to change the law. Because someone, one person that happened to be an old woman, had so much self-respect and she said, I am not going anywhere. I belong here and this is where I am sitting. See, it is very important what we think of ourselves. Why is that? And listen to this one very carefully. We do not control what kind of thoughts come into our mind. 
But here is the thing. We may not be able to choose what kind of thoughts come into our mind, but we definitely make the choice of what kind of thoughts we want to dwell in. I may not be able to control it when it comes to me, but I have full control whether I continue with it or I do not. And here is the thing. They say, watch your thoughts. They become words. Watch your words. They become action. Watch your action. It becomes habit. Watch your habits. It becomes your character. Watch your character. That becomes your destiny. So now Islam tells you to begin with, watch out for your thoughts. As little as no sense we give it or no time we, we devote to it, but it is going, it is so powerful, it is so strong that it is going to determine your destiny. That is how strong your thoughts are. You know, whenever the oppressor wants to oppress, they make sure that the first thing that they do is that they dehumanize the person. Strip them away for this human dignity and integrity. And from there on, we go into exploiting and we go into killing and we go into the different things. And that is why Frederick Douglass used to say, Subhanallah, this man, Frederick Douglass, if you ever get a chance to read his books and his writings, please do so. Frederick Douglass, remember, this is a slave. He is a slave. And he had this so much passion, longing for freedom. What does he say? He said, the soul within me, no one can degrade. You can tell me that I am a slave, but it is not what you think of me that is important. What is important is, what do I think of myself? For the soul within me, no one can degrade. And that is why they say, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Can I force you to feel inferior? Can I really do that? I cannot. I can talk, I can tell, but the minute you feel inferior, it was by choice. Because people cannot do that. People, have not, people do not have that much power over us. And that is why my brothers and sisters, we cannot be ashamed of ourselves. We've got a contribution to make to humanity. And in order to make that contribution, you must see yourself as such. You know, in today's world, it is very interesting how people are told to feel about themselves. A lot in the West, it has to do with your physical appearance. If you look good, you are right, you feel good. And they emphasize good looks. And they say, feel, look better, feel better. And images are sold where women in the U.S., one of every four girls who are in the fourth grade have some sort of eating disorder, be it anorexia, be it bulimia, or whatever it is, because TV told them they're too fat. You're overweight. You know, in order to be acceptable by us, you must be 120 pounds. Preferably, they have a figure 36, 24, 36. If you do not fit that figure, then you are not beautiful. And people work so hard. Women work so hard, so unbelievably hard to fit the image that was given to them. And I ask, to begin with, who put that image as the standards? Who said 120 pounds are not good? In Africa, it's 220 pounds that are good. But I really have a problem with that. Who is setting the standards? And why are you falling into these standards? Why is someone else telling you how to feel about yourself? That is so much power to give to other people. But people do this. I remember when I was in high school, I had a classmate. She did not come to school for 10 days or two weeks. And when she came back, the teacher said, Susie, where were you? And Susie was in the hospital because she cut her wrist because she thought that she was too fat and ugly and she was not accepted by society. This is how powerful self-image is. How do you see yourself? Really, how do you see yourself? Now we see that it is your body. You know, plastic surgery is in the rise nowadays, especially in the West. 
They've got people that come from Asia, and they've got, you know, smaller eyes than the average, or well, they've got smaller eyes, let's say. And they come in, and one of the things that they want to do is that they want to widen their eyes. Because that is what is expected generally to be beautiful in the States. Other people come, that's in the States, women, you know, they say that, you know, in order to be sexy, in order to be attractive, you know, you've got to alter your body a little bit so that society appreciates you. So now what do they have? And it's a booming business, breast enlargement. I remember one time, during a cartoon, see we have a lot more commercials in the States than you do. During a cartoon, cartoon is a show for kids. In it, there was a commercial, you know, and cartoons are usually watched by kids, it's little children that are watching it. In it, there was a commercial about breast enlargement. Because now what society respects or what society adores is this type of home. One time the Gap company, they had a skirt, a jeans skirt, and it was designed for 10 year old girls. And the jeans were unbelievably short. They were so short that some of the parents, they approached the Gap company and they said, these jeans are very short. Why is that? And the marketing department of the Gap company said, we want to teach younger girls how to dress sexy. So the next time when I see this girl, the 10 year old girl, they do not want me to see an innocent 10 year old girl. They want me to see a sexy 10 year old girl. But that is the image again that is sold to people. That's what you do. I have a lot of interest in studying sociology and you know how things are changing. So one day, I am watching Oprah Winfrey. You probably know about her. She has a talk show in the States. And the talk show was about, is your dress appropriate for your age? Now that's the women. Said, is your dress appropriate to your age? So what they did is that they stood in front of the mall, like your dispenser here. Mall is, you know, where they have the, the shops for clothing and what have you. And a woman would pass by and someone would have the mic and they would say, excuse us, or excuse me, how old are you? And the woman would say her old and then they would see whether she was dressed properly for her age or not. But here is the conclusion. And here is the advice that was given to the women. They said, if you are under 35, show your thighs, meaning that mini skirts, that's good. If you are between 35 and 45, show a little bit of cleavage. If you are over 55, then we recommend that you show your arms. If you are over 60, then show a lot of neck. And then it concluded by saying, women, if you dress too conservatively, you become invisible. And who wants to be invisible? But now, here's what, the, well, here's what they're saying. They're saying that if you fit the standards and the criterions that we put for you, then you are doing good. Now, people with massive inferiority complex, what they do is that they want to follow whatever is being dashed to us from out there. It's an ever-changing culture, but somehow the belief is that if you become a little bit closer to them, then at that point you are making progress. You know, in the 1950s, uh, Western women, when they saw Indian women wearing the sari, and I think part, that, that's how I say it, I think, wearing their sari, what happens is that, you know, the dress is that women would show their belly button. Now, these women in the West in the 1950s or 60s, they said, oh, that is so uncivil. You know, them crazy women, how are they going around, you know, showing their belly button? Today, that is the fashion in the West. You go around and you show your belly button. But the question is, who is putting these standards out there, my brothers and sisters? In Islam, your body should not be making a statement about yourself. Your body is not to be used as a vehicle to make statements about you. You make statements about you and not the way you look. I'm in contentment, alhamdulillah, with the way Allah created me. And that's how I like it. If Allah said I look this way, MashaAllah, then I'm happy with the way that Allah made me. That's where it ends for a Muslim. However, there is also things that tell us, you know, you should feel good about yourselves if you have money, position or possession. 
and the way they do commercial is let Lexus speak for you. Now, I don't want a piece of metal speaking for me. I want to speak for me. Or you sit and we do the talking. No, you don't do the talking. I want to do my talking. Because there is only one me, and only that me can represent me, not you. So again, in Islam, we are supposed to have that good you know, feel about who we are. To begin with, you say, well, where do I get this feel from? Listen to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمُ and we have indeed honored all children of Adam, the sons of Adam, Muslims, non-Muslims, men, women, whoever it may be, said, all are honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to begin with, you are one of those who are honored by Allah. That's number one. You know, someone will say, that is really nice, but you know, so that means that all humans are like this. Well, it goes on. And the hadith goes on to tell us that another statement, is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says that you know the son of Adam would seek getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until he has that very personal relationship with Allah and it goes on to say that if Allah loves any of his servants he calls upon the dwellers of heaven O oh, dwellers of heaven I love this servant of mine O oh, dwellers of heaven love this servant of mine it is so deep that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said if you mention Allah God Almighty in an assembly Allah will make a mention of you in a better assembly. Can you imagine this honor? Said, if you make a mention of Allah in an assembly, Allah will make a mention of you in a better assembly. Then he said, and if you make a mention of God in yourself, Allah will make a mention of you in himself. Do you see how deep that is? And that is why we say, if the way you feel about yourself comes from some other place other than your relationship with your Creator, you are in deep trouble. If the way you feel about yourself comes from other than your relationship with your Creator, you are in deep trouble. One time it was said that a man by the name of Hakim ibn Hizam, not a Muslim, really admired the Prophet wasallam, came to him and he presented him with a gown. And they said that that gown belonged to Ziyaz and the mighty king of Yemen. He said, the Prophet took my gift and put it on. He said, I have never seen someone more handsome, someone more beautiful than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that gown. Then he said, the next day, the next morning, as I was walking in the market of Medina, I saw Usama ibn Zayd, another man, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I saw him wearing the same gown that last night I gave to the Prophet ﷺ that one day belonged to Ziyazan, the mighty king of Yemen. So Hakim ibn Hizam looked at Usama. And when the scholars of Sira history describe Usama, they say, وَكَانَ أُسَامَةُ دَمِيمًا Usama was an ugly man, they say. Beautiful companion. But they said that physically he was an ugly man. And they describe this by saying, he had very dark skin, he had very deep eyes, thick lips, and he had very flat nose. Now this is not to say this is what makes someone beautiful or not beautiful, but this is how he was described. So he looked at him and his father happened to be a former slave. So Hakim ibn Hizam looked at him and he said, Anta ya Usama, you Usama, you are wearing the gown that one day belonged to Ziyazan, the mighty king of Yemen. See, what is implied in that statement is, look, you're black, your father was a slave, Ziyazan was a mighty king, and today you are wearing his gown. What does Usama say? You know, really sorry, I just happened to be there and the Prophet gave it to me. He looked at him and with pride he said, Wallahi, ana khairun min Ziyazan. By Allah, I am better than Ziyazan. Wallahi, inna abi khairun min abi. And by Allah, my father is better than his father. Wallahi, by Allah, my mother is better than his mother. For I and my family confess, La ilaha illallah, but that king of yours never said, La ilaha illallah. <laughs> and the idea is, where do you get pride from? What is your source of pride? You feel all good about yourself. You may be full of yourself. But the question is, where do I get that pride? And in Islam we say it comes from two things. Our relationship with Almighty Allah 
and number two, our contribution to humanity. If you have a good relationship with Allah, it must be translated that you must be positively be contributing to humanity. So that we said, you know, people talk about pride. What is pride? Pride is when you see yourself as a holder of rights and has some contribution to make to humanity. So if you're proud of yourself, if you feel good about yourself, then we want to see some contribution to humanity. Because if you do not feel good about yourself, my brothers and sisters, you can be crushed. Let me give you an example. Domestic violence. Women who are beaten by their husbands, Muslims and non-Muslims. And we see a lot of it. I told the story sometimes we do this in the name of God. In the U.S., a woman was presented in court. She had broken ribs. She had a broken nose. And when the husband was asked, why did you do this? He said, God gave me permission in the Quran. But anyways, let me tell you what happens to these women. Now these women, they go to emergency rooms with broken ribs. They come to it with broken noses. Sometimes they're kicked in their stomach to the point where their kidneys rupture. You know what is interesting though? An average woman who is in an abusive, physically abusive relationship, such as in marriage, it takes her an average of 12 to 18 years to say this is enough. It takes a woman who is physically abused an average of 12 to 18 years to walk out of that relationship. And you would say, why is it taking her so long? I mean, if he's done it once, twice, or three times, you know, that's an indication that you should be walking out. But what happens is that in the process, it's not only the physical abuse, but along with it, the soul is also crushed. So at that point, and it is so interesting because when these women come into counseling, so what happened today? Oh, it's all my fault. I should have cooked dinner in time. Or I should have given him a hot meal or I should have cleaned the house before he comes. What happens now, the oppressed is now seeing himself as the one who is at fault and not the oppressor. Because their feel about themselves was so crushed to that point. And again we say, my brothers and sisters, as Muslims, self-pity does not exist. Helen Keller, an American author, she was deaf, she was mute, could not speak. And she was blind. What does she say? She says the following. Self-pity is our worst enemy. And if we ever yield to it, we will never be able to accomplish anything wise in the world. Feeling sorry for yourself. Feeling that you're not worth it. That is why the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa taught us that, you know, there has got to be something about you that speaks for you. You know in Islam it is, it is haram to be begging if there is no need for you to be begging. You just do not become a beggar. Well one of the attributes of God is that He is Al-Ghani, the self-sufficient. So now I derive one of my attributes, one of my character is that I am self-sufficient. It may not be a lot that I have, but if, if it suffices me, then that makes me feel good about myself. I don't go around begging. It was also said that the Prophet ﷺ once took an allegiance with people and he said, do not ask for anything. He said, if you can help it, do not ask. They will be mounting their camels or their horses. Their whip would fall down. There are other people around them, they can say, would you please hand me that whip? They would not do it. They would come down because they took an allegiance with the Prophet that they would not ask people for anything. And again, part of crushing your soul is that when people have a say over your sustenance. Give the example about interest and how that can crush souls and it can crush communities. The government in Uganda, Central Africa, spends the equivalence of two dollars per citizen on health care. The same government spends eleven dollars on debts and interest per citizen. How do you expect that government to come up? How do you expect that country to recover? But the idea is we are going to do whatever it is to take to bend your self-pride, your self-esteem, and your dignity. So my brothers and sisters, feel good about yourself. But see, feeling good about yourself is not a statement that you say. These actions, and that is why again the Prophet 
would teach us about, you know, character. How do you build a character that makes you feel good about yourself? So you can say it, but it may not be real. It may be very, very empty. And we live in a time where there is so much emphasis on appearance, but not on essence. On outside, but not really in the inside. Give you an example. Today in the world, we keep asking for more. In reality, we are getting far less. But we are told that it is more and more. We have more food, but less nutrition. We have more medications, but less wellness. We have a lot more conveniences, but we have less time. We have a lot of possessions, but we have less value. We may be getting a lot of income, but we are ending up with less. Uh, yet we are told that it is really more, and in reality, we are really getting less. We all long to buy a house, but very few of us are building a home. One time a father said to me, last summer, I gave my, my son, who is 18, I gave him $15,000 to go into the stock market, buy and sell stocks, so that he learns how to make a living. And I said, that is very good. At a young age, you are teaching your son how to make a living. I wonder if your son knows how to make a life. Because many times, although that's what we are occupied and consumed with, but in reality, we are missing on a lot more, my brothers and sisters. Another thing about self-esteem is this. They say, persons of self-esteem or of high self-esteem are not driven to make themselves superior to others. They do not seek to prove their value by measuring themselves against a comparative standard. Their joy is being who they are, not being better than someone else. I don't feel good about myself because of someone else, because there is someone else that is better than me. Again, the Prophet would teach us about building character. He would tell you things that will make you and should make you feel good about yourself if they are practiced. One time the Prophet ﷺ was approached by Abu Dhar, may Allah be pleased with him, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. You know one thing about Muhammad ﷺ is that he was very approachable. Whoever had a question, easily accessible, anyone can ask him a question. They said that sometimes Bedouins would come and they would want to ask him a question and they couldn't tell who he is because he was one of the people. And that's what we want of our leaders, be one of us and not be up there. And Muhammad ﷺ gave the best example of this. He said that he would be walking, a young girl would come and would grab his hand and say, I need to talk to you. And she would not let go of his hand until she speaks her heart and whatever it is that she wants. See now, when we define ethics in Islam, and, and that is really the meaning, being God conscious is being ethical. However, the way we define ethics is by saying, ethics is what you do when no one else is looking. Because you can be ethical when people are around you. So now, what happens is that the Prophet ﷺ says, do what is right regardless whether people are looking at you or they are not looking at you. So what happens when you do that right, although you were in privacy, you feel all good about yourself. The Prophet ﷺ said that there will be a group of people. In the day of judgment they come. And they will have so much, you know, uh, good deeds on their back, mountains of good deeds. And then in a sudden, it will all be wiped out like ashes with wind. And they would ask, what happened? Why is this happening? They said, whenever we were in public, we were decent. But the minute we were by ourselves, we did what we wanted. See, there are two types of freedom. They say freedom is doing what you want. In Islam, freedom is doing what you ought to be doing. They say freedom is about expressing yourself. In Islam, we say freedom is about governing yourself. And that is the whole concept of taqwa, governing yourself. Then Abu Dhar says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, now remember, the idea is now building character so that the individual ends up feeling good about him. He said, Prophet of Allah, give me more. The Prophet ﷺ said, said, Make sure that you are in remembrance with the book of Allah, in good contact with the book of Allah. And when we speak of Quran as being a book of barakah, it is not the mere utterness 
the mere, you know, uh, just the mere uh, recitation of the Quran that brings the barakah. It is following what the Quran says that brings the barakah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Wa kam min qari'in yaqra'u al-Qur'an wa al-Qur'an yal'anu." And how many people will be reciting the Quran and at the same time the Quran is cursing them? Because they're reciting one thing, but they're doing something else. So there's got to be consist consistency of what you're doing. Prophet of Allah, give me more. And the Prophet sallallahu would say, "La tukthir al-dhahik, fa innahu yumit al-qalb wa yudhibu nur al-wajh." He said, "Do not laugh excessively. It kills your heart and it takes the dignity away from your face." Now remember, Islam is not against you having fun. He said, but have a serious life. Feel the pain of other people. Have your times of joy. But make sure that you feel the pain of humanity. How is it that we can be feeling good and having fun all the time and our next door neighbor is suffering? How is it that as a nation, we can be spending money here and there, spending more money on missiles than we do on butter, more money on bombs than we do on books, yet other people are suffering and humanity is suffering. Such a thing is not Islamically acceptable. You know, it's so funny, people have gotten so good with it that nowadays they're speaking of special kind of weapons. And they said, these weapons are so good, they kill humans, but they save the buildings. This is how good these weapons are. They save the buildings, but they kill humans. Have an element of seriousness in your life. Feel what other people are feeling. The Prophet ﷺ said that, you know, Allah would be talking to one of his servants and he would say, Oh my servant, I was sick, but you did not visit me. And that servant would say, How do you get sick and you are the Lord of the worlds? How does that happen? And Allah would say, Did you not know so and so person was sick and you did not visit them? Had you visited them, I would have been there. And then you say, I was hungry, but you did not feed me. How do I feed you? And you are the Lord of the worlds. And he would say, did you not know that so and so person was hungry and you did not feed them? Had you fed them, you would have indeed found me there. And again, the beauty of Islam, my brothers and sisters, is in implementing it. If what we believe in does not impact how we behave, then what we believe in is not important. It is not important if we do not act upon it. Then he says, Prophet of Allah, give me more. You eliminate oppression. You are in jihad. Martin Luther King said it so beautifully. He said, if you did not find a cause that is worthy of dying for, then your life is not worth living. If you did not find a cause worth dying for, then your life is not worth living. He would say. And then he said, Prophet of Allah, give me more. I want to learn more about, you know, these things. And remember and just imagine the seriousness, the pain that you feel for people, the fact that you are having this good relationship with the revelation of God, the fact that you're God conscious, and see how does that impact yourself? How does that make you feel about yourself? Be good to people or be good to your relatives, even though they may not be good to you. And it's so sad that nowadays you hear it. I have not spoken to my father for seven years. And that brother of mine, if I see him, I am going to kill him and strangle him. And my aunt, don't even mention her name, that aunt, a'uzu billah from that aunt. And people go on and on and on. You know what, in Islam, again, you cannot live for me, myself, and I. Other peoples have rights. And you ought to fulfill the rights. You have obligations, but you also have to fulfill your rights. A man came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, or like some of us would say, you know, I'm really good to my uh, relatives, but they are really not good to me, so I decided that I'm going to bring it to an end. A man comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he says, Oh Prophet of Allah, I have relatives. I am very good to them, but they are not good to me. Every time I do goodness to them, they turn back and they do something bad. Every time I try to keep in touch with them, they cut me off. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a Muslim is not he who is engaged in a tit for a tat. Because they did, I am going to do. Rather, a Muslim is he who does what is right, regardless of how other people react to it. We're talking about uh, an argument that took place between two men. And one of them was very rude and the other one was very gentle. And in the process, that person became more rude and this person was becoming very gentle. So after the fight was over or the argument was over, someone came and he said, you know, that person was very rude to you, but you treated him like a gentleman. And the man said, I treated him like a gentleman because I am one. See, being a gentleman is not conditional. If you're a gentleman, you're a gentleman all the time. 
You do not allow other people to pull you down to where they are, but rather you should be picking up people to where you are. You know, with all due respect to our good friend, the bishop here, whenever um, Christians speak of Christianity, the word love always comes up. And there is this love element that is always equated with Christianity. Rightly so. Jesus, peace be upon him, taught love. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, also of that line, taught love. And for some reason, I don't know what it is, for us Muslims, there seems to be, you know, as we act and behave as if love is not really part of the religion. Did you know that? The word love was mentioned over 92 times in the Quran. One of the names of Allah is Al-Muhib, the one who is loving. In fact, one of the conditions if you want to go to paradise is that you must be a loving person. The Prophet ﷺ said, Wallah, he said, by Allah, Wallahi la tadkhulul jannata hatta tu'minu. By Allah, you will not be admitted to paradise unless you believe. Wallahi la tu'minu hatta tahabu. And by Allah, you are not believers until and unless you love one another. A man walks by him and the Prophet ﷺ stops him and he says, would you like to be admitted to paradise? And the man says yes, with a big smile on his face. And then the Prophet ﷺ gives him the golden rule. Then, then, love for your brother that which you love for yourself. What do you love for yourself? And there is a challenge here, my brothers and sisters. In the Quran, we are told, You will not be called righteousness or you will not attain righteousness unless you spend of that which you love most. What do you love most? And will your heart give it out dearly? Now remember, in the process of doing so, my brothers and sisters, they said that, you know, this is how you feel good about yourself. They had a story that one day, and it happened in 1960s, said that this man was driving such a big car, and he had it parked on the street. And, when, and he did something inside to the store, and when he came out, there was this young boy and he was walking around the car and he was admiring the car he was touching it feeling the, the the tires on it and just feeling the rubber seeing himself in the mirror and the man was very proud because it was a brand new car so he came and he said um, you like it boy do you like my car and he said oh sir it is a beautiful car sir so the man looked at him and said my brother gave it to me as a gift and the young boy said i wish what do you think he said? I wish what? Come on, someone yell an answer. I wish I had a brother like that, right? Right. The boy says, oh man, I wish I can be like your brother. So now is, the man is very impressed and he just loves, he did not expect such an answer. He expected that the boy will say, I wish I had a brother like yours. So he tells him, well, son, would you like a ride in my car? And the young boy looks at him and he says, I would love that. But can you please take me to where we live? So the man is thinking to himself, of course, that's where he wants me to take him. He is going to show off, you know, to the children of the village that I was driven in such a nice car. So they go there and they stop. And when they stop, he said, sir, can you please wait for a few minutes? He says, okay, fine, he's probably going to get his, his friends to come and see, you know, what kind of a car he was in. So he went there, and he said, I saw him from a distance coming back, but he was not walking very straight. He seemed like it, he had something that he was carrying on his back. And when they got closer, he placed his brother on the ground. His brother was crippled. And he looked at him and he said, brother, one day I am going to buy you a car like this one. But see, that is the beauty, and that is why our beloved Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, used to say, blessed are those who give. There is more blessings in giving than there is in taking. My brother, see, when you do this, when you really go out there and make a difference, sometimes it just can be, subhanAllah, you never know what it is. A word that can change, you know, lives of people something that someone said to you, and it will be so unbelievable. 
I was once told they had a boss in one of the uh, companies in the U.S. He once gathered his employees. Uh, actually, before that, a young man came to him and he said, Sir, we are doing this research at school. I would like to give you three cards, but you have got to pay me $10 for it. I'll give you three cards, and the cards, you know, just the word, I love you. And you have to give it to, you have to take one for yourself and then sell the other two cards for $10, and then you go like this. So he said, I paid the $10, and I took the three cards. I called one of my employees, and I explained the school project to him, and I sold him the two cards for $10. And he went on, and he sold the other two cards to someone else. So he said, I held the card in my hand, and I said, whom do I give this card to? Whom do I give it to? So he said, I went home, and I called my son. So what happened is that he said he went home, and he called his son. And he said, you know what, son? really have not spent a lot of time with you. But I've always wanted to tell you this, and today I think I have a good opportunity to tell you this. And he handed him the card that said, I love you. So the son looked back at his dad and he said, you know what, dad, I want you to come with me. And he took him upstairs to his room, and he showed him a pistol. I, what do you call a pistol? Like a gun. And he said, dad, I hated you so much, that tonight I have made up my mind that I was going to kill myself. But it was this action that made the difference. Many times, you know, that is never there. The Prophet ﷺ would say, you know, if you love a brother of yours, then make sure that you share that with them. You know, it is so sad that nowadays, we have to teach people how to love. Love is so easy, but we have to teach it to people. And hate is so easy. Everyone is hating. We have to justify our love, but there is nothing wrong with our hate. And Islam, my brothers and sisters, that is not acceptable. It is sufficient to call you a sinner that you get mad at people for that which you yourself, you are guilty of. And many times that happens. We are guilty of it, yet we think that we can criticize other people for it. Yet we ourselves, we are guilty of it. We do it all the time. Oh, I cannot believe the way he talks to his, to his wife. Or I cannot believe the way she talks to her husband. But then we never really see how do we do that with one another. Yet we get mad at people for doing it. And we ourselves, we are, we are in that boat. That inconsistency, the moral double standards, where it is okay for me to do, but not okay for other people to do. Sometimes we as a Muslim community collectively, we are guilty of this. Oh, we are so against France for banning the hijab, the headscarf for women. But we don't say anything when Tunisia and Turkey, they banned the hijab. Oh, we are so mad at the way Ariel Sharon, that Zionist thug, treats the Palestinians. But we say nothing as the way other dictators treat their Muslim fellow humans or fellow citizens. We are so mad when this happens, yet there is nothing wrong when we or some of us do it. That inconsistency, my brothers and sisters, is not Islamically acceptable. If it is wrong, you need to say that. It is wrong. The culture of silence has got to be broken. Because the worst type of betrayal is silence. He who sees wrong and does not say anything about it is a mute devil. You see, do something about it. You claim to have Izza as a person with dignity. You are the person that can say no and point out the wrong. But you don't do that. And again, the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is to liberate you, make you a person of dignity and integrity so that you feel good about yourself. The minute you start feeling good about yourself, you have something to share to humanity. Very quickly, the way we talk to our spouses, the way we talk to our children must be one of encouragement. The way you talk to children, we are always putting them down. Always derogatory terms. The way you talk to your spouse, always derogatory terms, this and that. Not knowing that words can do magic to people. So one day, there was this young boy, you know, playing by himself. No one was throwing the ball to him. He was just here, and here's what he would do. He had the ball on his left hand and the bat on his right hand. He throws the ball up and tries and swings, trying to hit the ball. And there was an old man looking at him. So the boy tries, you know, throws up the ball and tries to hit the ball, and he misses. So the old man looks at him and says, you're a good player, my son. 
And the son is saying, yeah, right, I just missed it. So he gets the ball again, and he swings, and he misses. You're a very good player, my son, says the old man. And now this young man is just very agitated because, you know, he's making fun of him. So again, he tries three times, and he swings, and he misses the ball again. And the old man says, an excellent player you are, my son. And the boy says to himself, I'm going to try it one more time. And if I miss, I am going to smash his head with this bat. Okay. So he takes the ball, and he tries, and he misses again. And the old man says, superb player, my son. So the young boy comes to him and says, what are you talking about? I just missed the ball four times. And you're telling me that I'm a good batter hitting? He said, son, I was not talking about your batting skills. I was talking about your pitching skills. But that is really the idea, my brothers and sisters. And that is many times we put down people, even though what people need most is encouragement. We just have this ability of crushing the souls and the hearts of our brothers and sisters. Be selective in what you say. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ مِيثَاقَهُمْ He said, Allah has took a covenant with the children of Israel that they worship none but Allah that they do good to their parents, that they take care of the orphans, that they do this. And then he said, That you say the best of words to people. Can you imagine this? In the same line of worship Allah, be good to your parents, one of the covenants, one of the conditions of that covenant is that whenever you speak to people, make sure that you say the best of words. Very selective in what you say to people. Because words have that ability to crush our souls if we are not very careful. What happens to a sister if she gets divorced? How does the community see a divorced sister? It is so sad that in our cultures, a divorced woman is an unwanted woman. She's almost an outcast. And if she's a little older, then her chances of getting remarried are almost close to zero. And if she has children, you can forget about it. But now they are putting, they are being put down, where again souls and hearts are crushed. Just another human being. Maybe the previous relationship did not work out, and people are not even interested why. The guy was the drunk, he was an alcoholic, he was abusing her, he was this. People are not interested. And they use some of the worst words to describe them. She's a second hand, I don't want her. She's being used, I don't want that. You can't, you can't be saying this. Do you know what kind of impact or what kind of, that, does that leave on them when they hear something like this? I was once invited to a retreat. And all the people that were in the retreat, about 120 of them, they happened to be AIDS or HIV patients. And they invited, you know, different religious uh, leaders to come and present their religious point of view as far as the concept of forgiveness is concerned. And I went there. I was the only Muslim. It was organized by a church. Something that I really admired about the organizers of that, of that church. Because they reached out to a community that is so forgotten, so outcasted and ostracized. So I went there and they said, you know, we want you to talk about forgiveness. And as we are chatting, you know, people said, uh, there was a statement, whom do you need to forgive? Or are you having a hard time forgiving some people? And they would all say, you know what? I am having a hard time forgiving my family. I have a hard time forgiving my friends. I have a hard time forgiving humanity. Because of this disease, no one wants to talk to me. My family disowned me. Now again, regardless of how people contracted that disease, they are still part of the holders of human dignity and integrity, but we are putting them down. How about the people that came to Islam? Our revered brothers and sisters. Do we see them as full Muslims, or do we see them as almost Muslims? Does the community respect them as much as we do with one, everyone else? Or you know what? They are not as good as the others. 
not knowing that it takes a lot more courage to say what I was doing was wrong and now I am to have uh, to restart my life. We don't give them enough credit, my brothers and sisters. What about reaching out to them? And all the downtrodden, you know, the forgotten people of our community. If you are feeling good about yourself and you should be, then that should be transformed in the form of actions to other people in our community, my brothers and sisters. Now take the time, find out who needs the help, whom do you extend a helping hand to. For the way you express your pride and your self-esteem is what kind of a contribution can I make to other people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us facilitators of peace and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who contribute positively to humanity. Aqulu qawli hadu astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair. Now we go to the question and answer session. I request the brothers and sisters who are interested in asking questions can just walk up to the mic and ask. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Do we get sawab if we mention sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the Prophet's name? The question is, do we get sawab? Are we rewarded for saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after mentioning his name? We've been commanded in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما صلى الله عليه وسلم said O ye who believe indeed Allah offers his prayers meaning forgiving him and indeed the angels do asking Allah to forgive him so ye who believe make sure that you say صلى الله عليه وسلم something that I forgot to mention to my non-Muslim brothers and sisters and that is every time you hear us saying the word صلى الله عليه وسلم or Jesus peace be upon him or عليه السلام that is our way of showing respect and appreciation to the effort and the struggle and the sacrifice that these great people have done. So every time we mention their name, along with it comes a dua. We pray that Allah rewards them best for what they have done. The Prophet ﷺ said, al bakhilu fal bakhilu He said, the stingy man, a very stingy man, the stingiest of all, he who hears my name but does not offer salah on me. So yes, we do get the reward for that. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ صَلَّى عَلَيَّ صَلَاةً صَلَّى اللَّهُ بِهَا عَلَيْهِ عَشْرًا Every time you make one salah offered to the Prophet ﷺ, Allah gives you ten times what you have, uh, what you have said. Uh, my question is, uh, if all are preaching about peace, generally if you take, uh, I've read the basically about all religions, if you talk about peace, then what is the, why is there conflict? I would like to know that. It's a good question. I think we were touching upon it some other time. If all religions are preaching peace, if Jesus spoke peace and said, blessed are the peacemakers. If Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came with a religion where the name of it is peace, how come there is no peace in the world? We said this, it is, no, it is not the fault of the religion, rather it is the fault of those who claim to follow that religion. And we said that it is one thing to commit a crime, it is another thing to commit a crime in the name of God. And people are again guilty of this. We said that you are very right when you said, that we all have had our fair share of misusing and abusing the name of God. In my opinion, it is due to the fact that the letter of the law became more important than the spirit of the law. The spirit there is, you know, to have peace and harmony within humanity. But we became more interested and occupied and consumed with the, with the letter of the law and not really the spirit of the law. And clearly Allah says in the Quran, when they became negligent of what was revealed to them, we put hatred and animosity amongst them. Had you been uh, heedful of whatever revelation it is that you claim to be following, this would not be the case. So I would say again, it is not the fault of the religions, but rather it is the fault of those who claim to follow the religions. Okay, that's what I would like to say. Like uh, you are telling about the, you, if you take literally only you get into conflict with other people, your religion. Uh, that's what I have read Quran. In that I feel that uh, even the devil has told the same thing. Is the challenge is if you are, uh, I can get the followers easily because I'm not very sure about it. I just like to clarify the question. He is telling when you go on the straight path, I will meet them there. So the problem is if you take the spirit literally, you know, you get into conflict. That's what I would like to clarify from you. But that's not the case. I'm saying that the spirit 
as represented by the name of the religion itself is to spread peace. When I concluded my speech, I said, Oh Allah, make us facilitators of peace because that is the true spirit of Islam. The whole point of this conference is to say that, you know what, whatever misconceptions people have, whether they be Muslims or non-Muslims, the aim here is to show that Islam is a religion of peace, both in deeds as well as in theory. Now the fact that this may not be the case right now, it is not the fault of Islam, but rather it is the fault of Muslims. Assalamualaikum. While building a self-image of a child Islamically, is it appropriate for a child to be exposed or watch Cartoon Network since most of the cartoons is based on violence? It's a good question. Uh, since most of the kids are exposed, or most of the cartoons, they have violence in them. And it is unbelievable how much violence there is there in cartoons. One time I remember I was visiting my sister and her son, my nephew, was very busy, you know, uh, playing a video game. And I said, you know what, are you playing? And I went there to see. And here is what he was playing. You have a car, I think it was called a 1967 Chevy Malibu. That's the name of a car. And you have a distance and you have five minutes to make it there. But in along, you know, you're driving the car and you need to be there in five minutes. And they have a timer, of course, on the corner. And what happens is that on your way, there is going to be a red light, cars in front of you, and pedestrians. And if you stop, then it, the five minutes will expire, and you will never make it, and you lose the game. So what you do is, if you see people, kill them. If you see a car, crash into it. If you see a red light, pass it, and just keep going. And in the process, I'm saying, and, and there is so much excitement as he is playing the game, you know, crashing into people, into cars, and just moving on. And you see blood gushing all over the screen. And I said, what is happening here? And I say, not now, not now. You know, I am excited um, doing this. But th th there is a lot of violence in some of the cartoons and some of the video, video games that are shown there. Now, it is very easy to say the word haram. The challenge is not in saying haram. The challenge is in fighting alternatives. See this? The challenge is not in saying haram, but rather the challenge is in finding alternatives. And my, my opinion with regard to, to television is that television is a tool. And you really cannot say that a tool is halal or haram for just being a tool, but rather it is the way we use the tool that makes it halal or makes it haram. So, so to some people that specific tool may be haram, like a knife. If you use it to kill people with, then it becomes haram. If you're cutting your tomatoes with it, then it's a different, um, it's a different use. So I would have to know what cartoon you're talking about. Assalamu alaikum. I have a doubt that there is a hadith which says that the Prophet ﷺ said that a believer is one who feels that his sins are like a mountain upon his shoulders. But a disbeliever is one who just uh, shoes away his sins as if they were a fly on his nose. I'd like to say as a true Muslim, when we are feeling guilty about these sins, we wallow in self-pity, and that is a bad thing for our self-esteem. Then how do we go about it? That's an excellent question. And it is very true that some of us, when we look into our sins, you know, I have done this, and I have done that, and I have done this, and I have done that, it crushes our souls. We as human beings, the Prophet ﷺ said that every human is going to make a mistake. And the best of those who make the mistakes are those who repent back. Doing of the wrong, like perfection is not expected of us as Muslims. Doing wrong is one thing. Insisting on doing the wrong itself, that is where the wrong is. Like they say, you are not a failure because you fell down. You are a failure because you decided to stay down. And that is not the spirit of the Muslim. So I would say, especially dealing with the kind of God that we deal with. A God that you hibbut tawabin. He loves those who repent to him. A God that your good, your bad deeds are changed into good deeds. What happens is that when the Prophet ﷺ makes these statements, he is urging a sense of responsibility on our part. You know what? I have done a God of mistakes. I better be serious from now on, for I will be doomed if I do not take care of the past mistakes that I have done. So the idea is not to crush ourselves, that we pity ourselves, but rather it is to show humbleness and humility in the presence of Allah, that, oh Allah, I have sinned, 
but I am in my recovery period. And the Prophet wasallam said, whatever you know, whatever you have done in the past, tawbah, repentance will take care of it. But never allow your previous mistakes to hinder you from moving forward. And they say that the people who made the greatest mistakes are the people who did nothing because they thought that they can do very little. I have a doubt. Many people say that if you have uh, good deeds lower and uh, bad deeds more and um, then you go to hell. And then some people say if you, are, if you have little of Iman and don't do shirk, um, you go to uh, Jahannam. Can, uh, may I know the correct thing? What's your name? Salman. Salman, how old are you? Ten. Ten, mashallah. You know, when I was your age, I was ten too. <laughs> mashallah. Very, very good question. Salman is asking. Remember what we said the other day. Some people say this, some people say that. In Islam, it is very clear. If you say that I believe, you cannot just say that I believe and that is the end of it. You have got to do good deeds. Let me ask you this, Salman. If I tell you, Salman, I love you, and then I slap you on your face, that will not be nice. Will you believe me when I say I love you? And then I say, you know, Salman, I am really sorry. And I slap you again. And then I say, Salman, I am really sorry. And I slap you again. I am saying one thing, but I am doing something else. So it is not what I say, it is rather what I do is really what I'm saying or not. So if I say that I have Iman, there has to be a proof for that Iman. If I say I love you, then I have to do things that shows that I love you. If I say that I have Iman, I have to do things that show that I have Iman. And these things that we do, these things that we show, they are called Amal al-Salih. Righteous deeds, good deeds. These deeds can be either to ourselves, and these deeds must also be to other people, to the rest of creation of Allah. So I would say Iman is good, but by itself, it really will not help you. Good deeds are good, but without Iman, it will not help you. So in Islam, we believe that it has got to be a combination, like two things. Your beliefs, and then also your deeds, and not one without the other. And you know, Salman asked a very good question. Can you please give him a big hand for that? Assalamu alaikum. I want to know what exactly da'wah means. We have to respect human beings, and that, which is very important. Doing some important things for them, being nice to them. Does that mean da'wah, or does it mean that we have to invite them to be Muslims, like to follow the one God and things like that? It, it's a good question. Let me put it this way. The term da'wah is derived from the root verb da'a. And da'a means to invite. So if I have, let's say, uh, I have an occasion. I send you a card. And I put it in such a language that I expect you to come. And if you do not come, you will apologize nicely. That is called da'wah. Okay? So it's me informing you of something good that is taking place, I am saying it in such a language that you will either respond and come to the invitation or you will apologize for it nicely. So imagine this. It's a da'wah, right? It's an invitation. And I come to you and I say, you know, my wife has cooked a lot of poison today. Would you like to come and have some? It's a da'wah. It's an invitation. But no one will respond to it. So what happens is, in the process, what I tell you must be attractive for you to either appreciate or, you know, not uh, at least apologize nicely. And remember when we are dealing with non-Muslims, our job is not to convert. See, if the person feels that you are doing what you are doing so that you convert them, they're going to be very irritated by this. And that is not the behavior of a Muslim. You are giving people, you know, you're just making them aware. You are conveying and you are not converting. You are not convincing, but rather you are bringing about understanding. This makes you very comfortable, and it also makes them very comfortable. And da'wah, by the way, is not only words. You know, many times it's just what we say. What we... No, you are doing da'wah simply by being who you are and representing your religion, your character, in the best way that you possibly can. That is da'wah. Many times we feel that I am not doing da'wah because I am not talking Islam. Well, stop talking Islam and start 
doing Islam, and that makes it more attractive than just, you know, talk and talk and talk. And also the way we do da'wah, it's got to be with wisdom and also keeping in mind the dignity and integrity of that individual. You know, there was a hadith here that I wanted to go over with. You know where the Prophet ﷺ said that the Muslim is the mirror of another Muslim? It's a beautiful, it's an absolutely fabulous hadith. It's a very short statement, but there is so much wisdom in it. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you stood in front of the mirror and you, not, you were not looking very good and the mirror slapped you and said, get out of here, you don't look very good. The mirror usually does not do that. The mirror gives you your shortcomings and it does not say a word. Right? That's what the mirror does. You're, you are consulting the mirror and the mirror is answering back in a very beautiful way. And the mirror is so fair, there is so, more, so much adil, fairness and justice in the mirror because it does not fool you. Rather, if it's beautiful, it's going to say it's beautiful. And if not, it's going to say it's not. But it does it in such a way that you cannot refuse but to accept it. The more you look into it, you know, the more complete you become. But that is part of it and that is when we are giving da'wah, we ought to be giving it to, we, to Muslims or to non-Muslims. When we do it, we do it in such a fashion that will make it more acceptable by people from us. And the Prophet ﷺ did it in the best of ways. Be it in what he said or how we behave. But keep in mind that if you think that you are going to save these people or you care for them, then you want to do it in such a way that reflects that and not only words that we keep in our, you know, in our head. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh Yasir, Jazakallah. I would like to know how to be away from Nifaq and how we can apply sincerity and intention in our life, inshallah. Jazakallah. The question is how do we keep away from Nifaq or hypocrisy? Um, what happens is that in Islam it's not enough that you do good deeds. The motive behind them must also be good. It's not enough that you do good, but the motive behind it must also be genuine. Why do you do what you do? Some do it for fame. Some brings glamour. To others it brings money. To others it raises position or possession. In Islam you do goodness for the sake of goodness. And to put it in very few words, they say, أَن لَا تَطْلُبَ شَاهِدًا غَيْرَ اللَّهِ وَأَن لَا تَنْتَظِرَ أَجْرًا مِنْ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ He said, when you do what you do, seek no witness but Allah and wait for no reward but from Allah. That is what happens. And that is part of being cautious and being mindful of Allah that I do what I do because it pleases God and not necessarily because it, I will have some worldly gain. From it. In the process, you may receive worldly gain, but that was not the initial motive behind doing what you are doing. And that adds an ethical value to what you do. It really does. It adds an ethical value to our deeds, and it is not just mere actions, but rather they are very genuine and they are very ethical. Sister, please. Since you are talking so much about the way you present things, there are a lot of children nowadays, teenagers especially, who come and ask me that um, when we talk about hijab or things like that and they say does that mean that my friends who don't cover themselves in the Islamic manner does that mean that they are not good or does that mean um, they are indecent so uh, how are we supposed to present things to them in a nice way again good question mashallah remember as Muslims we are not judgmental especially with the, with the appearance of the individual. And please do not misunderstand me on this one. Said that one time, the Prophet ﷺ was presented with, uh, with a man that uh, drank alcohol. And he was being rebuked. And he was just being, you know, uh, put down by other people. Uh, and then the Prophet ﷺ, and he was just drinking all the time. This was not the first time. They brought him in so many different times. And one of them said, لَعَنَهُ Allah, You know, may Allah curse him. Or may he be cursed. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تكن عونا للشيطان على أخيك. Do not be on the side of the devil against your brother. Because now you are cursing him. Well, he made a mistake. It is too late not to make the mistake. The mistake is already there. So what happens afterwards? If someone falls down, what do you do? You go and you step on them? They already fell down. So what do you do? You extend your hand so that you pick them up. And that is how and what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa taught us. 
Many times, my brothers and sisters, the sin may be bad, but it does not necessarily indicate wickedness and evil in the individual. It could be due to weakness. We all have weaknesses, subhanAllah. We are all struggling to surrender. We all have our shortcomings. And we don't want people to be stepping on us when we fall down. We want people to be extending a helping hand so that they help us get up. And that is what I need a Muslim community for. That's why we have families. So that one of us, when one of us makes a mistake, the others do not only rebuke him, we can definitely criticize what took place. But ultimately what we want is that we want that person to come on our path and go and take that walk with us again. So I would say wrong it may be. But you cannot condemn, or you should not be condemning people for that, because that will only drive them away. A man comes into the masjid and he starts urinating in the middle of the masjid, or in the corner of the masjid. And the people go crazy. What are you doing? And they about, about to go and beat him up. And the Prophet ﷺ said, let him finish. He already started, so there is no point of doing anything now. And when it was done, he said to clean it up. And then he said, you know, a masjid is the house of Allah, and you should not be doing this. A man during the salah sneezes, someone else sneezes. In the salah he goes, Yerhamukullah, bless you. So people start looking at him. And in the salah he goes, why are you people looking at me? And now people are beating on their thighs. And he said, what's wrong with you people? And after the salah, the Prophet ﷺ looks back at him. And he says, you know, salah is a form of communication between the servant and his Lord. And none of this is supposed to be taking place. He said, I have not seen a better teacher. A better person to give an advice like Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In the previous case, the man said, "I love Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam," and then he raised his hand and he said, "Oh Allah, only admit me and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to paradise, and do not admit anyone else of these people to paradise," because he was so moved by the way he reacted. So we do make mistakes, and wallahi, when I make a mistake, I want a brother to extend a helping hand, and that's what I would tell you to do. They may not be wearing hijab, but it's not necessarily out of wickedness. It could be out of ignorance. It could be out to weakness. It could be whatever the reason is. But if we just keep condemning people, then what we are doing is that we are again crushing their souls. And, and we are really doing more damage than we are doing any goodness to our communities. Every night